Hello everyone, today we're talking about brain health with Paul Siboda. Uh, Paul is Director General of the Human Brain Project and CEO of eBrains. So uh, the first question is, uh, what is eBrains? Yes, thank you very much for uh, the question and uh, uh, wonderful to be with you today. Um, so eBrains is the emerging research infrastructure uh, for brain studies. Um, what I mean by research infrastructure um, is basically a collection of tools uh, and services that are meant to um, enable breakthroughs in brain research. Um, the uniqueness of this uh, endeavor is that um, it gives researchers um, um, the ability to um, get everything they need uh, in one place. So it's a one-stop shop, in other words. Uh, and rather, and instead of going to different places to 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 get your data curated, uh, to get um, a access to a simulator at different uh, levels of brain organization, you can come to eBrains, and we would uh, cater for all your needs. So. What are the three biggest obstacles to advancing brain research? I think uh, there is probably uh, one obstacle, one big, really big obstacle, which uh, has uh, many uh, forms and uh, shades. Um, and this is the question of data fragmentation. Um, I think most uh, people who are active in brain research would, uh, would agree with me that um, um, this field uh, sees a particular degree of uh, data fragmentation. Um, and it starts at the level of uh, neuroimaging data um, and continues uh, throughout the, the research uh, process. Um, and there are various uh, reasons for, for that. Uh, I think the, the complexity of the brain, uh, the inaccessibility of the brain uh, um, have a lot to, to do with it. We have uh, currently um, access to an enormous amount of data However, uh, it is still, uh, it exists in too many silos. Uh, and what this means is that uh, researchers cannot benefit from this effect of scale, which is uh, necessary in order to um, uh, arrive at uh, therapeutic and, uh, and diagnostic uh, solutions. Um, and what is the current uh, most exciting development in what is known about the brain? I would say that the most uh, exciting developments uh, uh, that that uh, we see in the uh, uh, in the work of eBrains and in the work of the Human Brain Project that is developing eBrains, uh, this is the uh, the higher uh, predictive power of integrated brain models. Um, so uh, brain models um, currently, um, uh, due to the uh, the integration of uh, higher and higher resolution data. Um, and due to the uh, the uh, mathematics which takes place on the basis of it, um, can provide um, a predictive power which uh, leads to applications in personalized medicine. So something which which has been um, a goal for a number of years is now becoming um, a reality. Uh, we are testing one such uh, uh, approach um, with regards to treating epilepsy uh, when uh, the virtual uh, brain-based uh, uh, software can assist uh, surgeons uh, in the performing of um, uh, epilepsy surgeries. So that means uh, uh, this type of integrated model can uh, provide um, uh, the uh, clinician with more insights about the, uh, the area where seizures uh, take place and uh, the area which needs to be operated upon. So, so this means uh, that we are beginning to see uh, very practical applications of these uh, um, integrated brain models uh, in personalized medicine. And this will continue. This uh, epilepsy is uh, simply the first field, the first domain where we are testing uh, these solutions. Um, other um, brain conditions um, and neurodegenerative disease in particular will also be very much um, uh, where these personalized uh, brain models will be, will be applied. So, so that I find to be the most uh, uh, exciting area in, uh, in brain science at the moment because um, basic science 
is beginning to lead towards uh, uh, application. Um, and that I think is what we've been looking for, for uh, over the years. We are very curious to hear what changes in a post-COVID world uh, need to be made to have better brain health and how we can uh, all contribute to containing the burden of uh, neurological conditions. So I think there are, there are two aspects worth uh, mentioning. First of all, uh, there has been a hidden pandemic uh, within the pandemic, uh, that of uh, uh, mental health uh, disorders. Uh, we had seen um, the numbers uh, getting um, uh, getting very serious, uh, getting very much worse uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so what this allowed us to um, to do is to expose the uh, uh, the challenge which exists with respect to mental health. Um, but more broadly speaking, I think in the in the hopefully post pandemic uh, worlds, uh, we will look at um, uh, the main um, public health uh, challenges such as the uh, cardiovascular uh, disease, cancer, and brain health uh, with uh, renewed impetus. Um, and brain health uh, needs to be treated as a public health um, priority um, for, for two reasons. First of all, because I believe the importance of good brain health will be more and more valued by, by citizens. Um, this means um, staying cognitively active longer uh, in, in life. Um, and also, of course, uh, the incidence of brain conditions, uh, I think, will be of, uh, of growing uh, concern uh, to the public at large, but also to policymakers. Uh, I mean, the figures are staggering. The uh, European Academy of Neurology has uh, estimated that over half of the Europeans are affected by brain conditions of different type from from uh, migraine on to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, the cost, of course, of, uh, of these diseases to public health systems are, are growing. That has to do with the, uh, with the aging of the society. Uh, so I believe uh, that the realization that um, uh, the stakes are uh, getting very, very serious indeed uh, will come in the, in the hopefully post-pandemic period. Uh, but will be combined also with this growing attachment uh, to our personal uh, interest in shaping our cognitive ability and staying healthy also in the sense of uh, having good brain health. Um, and what this means is that there will be more focus on uh, what needs to happen, both at the level of uh, public health organization, uh, but also uh, individually, in order to maintain that good brain health. Uh, so in the first uh, category, what I have in mind is uh, the integration of prevention into primary care. Um, I think there is a lot that, uh, that can be done to um, remain healthy for a longer period of time, also with regard to brain health. Um, and uh, I think individually, we also, um, as citizens, will be more and more aware of uh, how much depends on, on us in, uh, in maintaining this uh, good cognitive uh, uh, ability. So all that to me means that brain health uh, will become a much more significant public health priority in the, in the years to, uh, to come. It's both necessary and I think it's culturally in line with uh, where our societies are going right now. So thank you for your time and thank you for this interesting uh, interview. And um, it was a pleasure to meet you. Great. Yes, it's an so honor as a young guest, Dennis, to uh, have the opportunity to interview you.